Welcome to our second presentation in our series, Retrieving Romans. Uh, the topic today is Retrieving Why. Why this letter was written. And my name is Sigvit Hanstad. I'm a <coughs> research professor at Loma Linda University. And I, uh, my primary audience here are students at Loma Linda, medical students at Loma Linda University. <clears throat> so, looking back on what we talked about the first presentation, under the headline retrieving or retrieval. Uh, so, here are some points. Romans is the most influential letter ever written. Let's repeat that. And uh, I don't think anyone would contest it because the mountain of reader or the audience of readers and the mountain of studies of Romans is just incredible. <clears throat> so it is an old letter with a long reading tradition. Our task will uh, not only be reading it, but also retrieving because of all the layers that have been deposited on this letter. So the task of retrieval is inevitable. <clears throat> One of the things that has been lost, and that's true not only for Romans, <clears throat> is the inclusive, ecological, and relational tenor of Paul's outlook. I want to specify that. We are reading under the impact of profound, convulsive fractures in theology, the separation of the soul from the body. And in medicine, the separation of the individual from society, from non-human creation, and from the earth. And these are ecological configurations <coughs> and separations. And <coughs> my last point here, by way of review, the separation of the soul from the body is the ultimate insult to ecology because it disparages the material world and the vast complexity of material and physical relations, and thus uh, the need to do this. Uh, maybe I should have brought a spade or a hoe or something so we would be digging here, so we wouldn't just be looking at the surface, but we are doing a reading that is also an act of retrieval. Just a word about my own journey uh, as somewhat of a journey of retrieval. And this is my home village. It's called Tonstad. It is in Norway. There were fewer houses there when I was little than there is now. <clears throat> I went to high school at the Seventh-day Adventist High School uh, outside of Oslo, a boarding school. And I was interested in reading the Bible from my childhood. And that took off a little more when I was in high school. I went to Middle East College in Beirut, Lebanon, and I had my first uh, exposure to biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew. I was a theology major. Uh, then I went, uh, finished my college at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. I took pre-med. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with my life, <clears throat> but I'm very happy for the direction it took. From there, I went to Loma Linda University in California, uh, and I finished medical school. And <clears throat> during my residency, I took an MA in Biblical Studies uh, at Loma Linda, Loma Linda and La Sierra University. And then I was practicing medicine and doing some pastoral work uh, on the side in Norway. When uh, something happened, I was reading Paul. I was reading about big changes in the way that Paul's letters were uh, read. So I thought, I need to know more about that. I need to study that more closely. So I was able to go to Duke University to study with one of the leading scholars at Duke, Richard Hayes, who received me with such grace and has been a friend to me since that time. And <clears throat> I came away convinced that we do indeed need to re read Romans in a different way. Uh, <clears throat> from Duke, then I went to the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. This is the 
golf course in St. Andrews, the most famous golf course in the world. <clears throat> I don't play golf, <clears throat> but I was there to study uh, <clears throat> the faith language in the book of Revelation, and I wrote my dissertation on that. And then I came back to Loma Linda to teach, and one of the courses I have been teaching is Romans, and I have written a book about uh, it as well. Back to the letter. So we have a writer. This is Rembrandt's Paul. We have a letter. It's going to go to the Romans. And we have a destination. We have recipients. And they are in Rome. So uh, from the orig point of origin and the writer to the destination, it's quite a ways. And we are not in our time. We are in the ancient times. So sending a letter is much more complicated. In the US, it's quite convenient. You have a, a postman that comes to your door and delivers uh, <coughs> the mail. Uh, they do that in Norway too. <coughs> they do it less and less because they have been overtaken by even more convenience. You can just uh, write a letter on the internet on your computer and you click it and it is at the point of uh, uh, destination immediately. So we have compressed space, we have contracted space, and we have contracted time in amazing ways. Because from here to there is a split second. And uh, so distance and time has been uh, abolished in some ways when we send mail today. Not so in those ancient times, there is a kind of ecosystem even to uh, the conception of the letter. It doesn't come sort of parachuting in from nowhere into Rome. Uh, and we need to look at the, the earth and the soil and the geography a little uh, to get this right. And we need to have a reason and a sort of conception about letters in those days. Uh, and I will draw on the work of J. Christian Becker. I have said to others, <coughs> and, and this is not to, to because there are many excellent uh, books, but Christian Becker's book on Paul the Apostle, written around uh, 1980, is in my view one of the most amazing uh, uh, insightful books on Paul and, uh, and his situation. This is what he says. <clears throat> it, is a it is a methodological error to view Romans as a theological structure developed in a vacuum. A view that portrays Paul as engaged with himself in thought, wrestling with the perennial truth of the gospel. The hermeneutical advantage of timelessness cannot silence the historical illegitimacy and impossibility of this procedure. So what, what's he saying? What's, what's, what's the point? The point is that Paul's letter, Romans, has been read in isolation from context, in isolation from the situation, as though these are timeless truths that have no context, no ecology, as it were, no relational issues. And so we have in some ways leapfrogged from his time to ours without taking into consideration the differences in situation and the like. So <clears throat> to uh, illustrate this then, and <clears throat> the letter, and letters really are situational. There's a date on the letter. There is a place on the letter. Where are you when you wrote it? When did you write it? So the situational character of letters still persists today, even though on the internet now we don't put dates and we do it. It's going to be a hodgepodge. And we will not in the future have the benefit of preserving letters because we delete them right away and there is nothing left after us. It's a shame. <laughs> but these letters are situational. The letter has an occasion. It could be written in response to a need. In that case, it is reactive. Or it could be to lay the groundwork for a plan. In that way, it could be 
proactive. Now, which of these describes Romans the best? I will let you know in a moment <coughs> what I think about that. But either way, reading begins by trying to understand the situation. And this is what Christian Becker wants to tell you, that it is illegitimate and impossible, and you get off on the wrong foot if you ignore uh, the situation. So then the first thing that confronts us, of course, is the issue of distance <laughs> in the ancient world, because distance is real, and we are going to send a letter from, from here, from uh, uh, Corinth, from Greece, and it will travel mostly by sea to uh, Italy, and from Italy, uh, as we land in Italy, we will then uh, do, uh, uh, go uh, on foot uh, to, to Rome. And in the ancient world, that's quite a ways. So the points of origin then, Paul was in Corinth when he wrote this letter or dictated this letter, and he sent it with a courier who was most likely Phoebe, who lived in the port city of St. Crea. And that city is mentioned in chapter 16 in Romans. So we're not making this up. I'm not, I'm not uh, <coughs> saying anything that isn't uh, verifiable. And then it's going to arrive at Rome, and this is a picture from the <clears throat> Imperial Forum in Rome as it appears today. But some of the items here in the Forum did actually exist at the time when this letter arrived. So <clears throat> these are the parameters. This is the sort of uh, ground we have to tra traverse. Now, we said that there was dictation first. So someone, like Paul, he dictates the letter to an amanuensis. He is not writing it himself. The amanuensis in Paul's case was Tertius, uh, <clears throat> who is mentioned at the end of the letter. Then the letter will go not by United States Postal Service. It will go with a courier, someone who will hand carry the letter to the point of destination. And as another point of difference, when the courier arrives at the destination, the courier will read the letter out loud. Imagine that, that the postman comes to your door and, and <laughs> opens the letter for you and reads it for you too, and reads it to you too. We don't, the post, uh, postal people don't do that, but that is how mail was sent in the ancient world. Many people couldn't read. It was simple, so it's much more complicated now. So at the point of origin in this illustration, Paul uh, commissioning Phoebe to travel, so a woman will travel with the letter. She will go from this area in Greece to Rome, it's quite a ways, and she will eventually arrive here on the Via Appia Antica, just outside of Rome. <clears throat> so. What do we have? Sending mail in those days is costly, it is risky, and it is time consuming. It takes, it's a formidable project to send a letter. Here, this is from Google uh, sending, uh, going now from here in Greece by car and by boat in part. You can do it in 19 hours. I uh, found out uh, on the internet, <laughs> you cannot do it in 19 hours and the letter sent that Paul will send, <coughs> just to rub this in, um, uh, just to <coughs> belabor the point, sending and delivering mail. First, there is a uh, sea journey, and maybe that sea journey was not as straight as here. It's possible that the boat might have actually gone around the Peloponnese, which would have made it a longer journey. But, and, and you're not going by speedboat either, you're going on a sort of slow travel. So this is, you know, you have to buy a ticket, you have to travel like this, and the boat doesn't go every day, and so on. <clears throat> so then you have to do the overland thing to carry it on foot, 
from uh, whatever landing point there was here uh, to Rome. <coughs> and then <coughs> you read the letter. This is the uh, courier now reading the letter. But here is another thing that we have to factor in. It isn't necessarily so that the person who delivered the letter just read it. Maybe she performed it. <coughs> that because in ancient times, and I have a friend in Germany, uh, <coughs> Bernhard Ostreich, Ostreicher, who is a, 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 an expert on what is called performance criticism, how to restore to biblical texts the element of a performed message. So uh, this is why our reader here isn't just reading. She wears masks. She plays one character one moment and another character another moment. There is a give and take, a dynamic in the letter that you certainly do not get if you just sit there and read this letter in monologue. These are elements, some of them are certain, some of them I say are tentative. <laughs> so why did he write the letter? It had to be a an urgent reason given, given the task, given the complexity of sending letters. You wouldn't send a letter every day or every week. You would be very selective. And uh, <clears throat> Douglas Campbell, who is a professor <clears throat> in New Testament at Duke University, he has in one of his books listed 11 possible reasons for why Romans was written. I have limited them to four reasons here, the four most plausible reasons, and here they are. Uh, to contain or to uh, put in place the, uh, or to make a, a message against counter-missionaries, that some of the Pauline faith communities were threatened by people who came after him and messed things up or came ahead of him sometimes and messed things up. That, that's a possibility. Uh, so is there textual support for that? There is. So that's a possibility. Now preparation for the Spanish mission. We mentioned that uh, last time. Uh, is there evidence for that? Paul writes this letter. In this case, he would be writing it proactively. Here he would be writing reactively. Here proactive prepare for the Spanish mission. Is there evidence for that? Is he planning to go to Spain? We have seen that he is in the letter. And then there is the idea that this is a theological testament, testament or defense of the gospel, a more sort of timeless, not so situational, you might say. So this used to be the way most readers thought of Romans. This is the most complete presentation of the gospel, and so on. Uh, and this view is the one that, that fares the poorest under the critique of Christian Becker, that you decontextualize the letter. So, but there, is, there are proponents, very important proponents for that view too, and maybe slight textual evidence even. And then there is the notion that Paul writes this letter to mediate between two groups in the Roman house churches, the, called the weak and the strong. And there are some proponents for this view, and there is textual evidence for it too. So there is textual support to some extent for all these and quite a bit for the first one. So <clears throat> I want to look at that phenomenon. Uh, and uh, uh, see what what uh, uh, we can make of it. So, are there counter missionaries in relation to Paul's mission? Are there people who who piggyback on his work, who maybe say some other things, who may in also in fact represent a threat to the whole mission? Is that possible? Does that uh, does that uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, apply? Could that apply to, to his letter to the Romans? So here is number one, and then I have some sub-points. Romans is very similar to Galatians. So there is an earlier letter 
Galatians and Romans is very similar. So point number one, they both have a conspicuous polemical tone. There is a kind of animation, kind of urgency, even to the point of being sarcastic. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I wish those who unsettle you would castrate themselves, castrate themselves. And the word in Greek here is much stronger than just castration. He is basically saying, I wish they would cut the, cut the whole thing off. That's how, how uh, sort of polemical it is, how, how, how uh, uh, animated it is. And then <clears throat> that's Galatians. Here is Romans. <clears throat> There is also an element of sarcasm here. This is the way I translate it in 2.1 or 2.3. Therefore, you have no excuse, O virtuous person, you and all who judge others. In passing judgment or another, you condemn yourself. So what is the point here? It is polemical and it is as though it addresses some view or some person that he wishes to correct that he wishes to confront. It is polemical, confrontational. And then in both of these let letters, unlike the other letters of Paul, with slight exception for 1 Corinthians, uh, there is an emphasis on circumcision. In fact, in Galatians, it's all over the letter. Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will not be of ben will be of no benefit to you. So here, something is at issue here. The issue is circumcision. Someone is telling the Galatian believers that they need to be circumcised, and Paul is telling them not so. So here, in Romans, same thing. Uh, <clears throat> let's see it here. It's like this verse parachutes into the text. Circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So suddenly in this letter, the topic of circumcision comes up without any warning, except that if you draw a connection between Galatians, where circumcision is such a big issue, you understand Romans better because that conversation and that controversy is continuing. <clears throat> it carries over <clears throat> in Paul's mission. <clears throat> and then there is a shame factor, an element of shame in both, uh, that is kind of strange, in both uh, letters here first in Galatians. But my friends, why am I still being persecuted if I'm still uh, preaching uh, circumcision? In that case, the shame of the cross has been removed. That is to say, circumcision had a social advantage. You could have a certain group identity that would make it safer for you. And if you don't get circumcised, you are more at risk. And here is Romans, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. How do you hear this when you see two groups? I am not ashamed of the gospel, but they are. My opponents are ashamed. So this is not a kind of statement in vacuum. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed. Someone else is. That's the contrast. <clears throat> so going on still on the point of the similarities between these two letters, here is the role of Abraham, a big chunk of text in Romans, a whole chapter, chapter 4, and almost a whole chapter in Galatians, chapter 3, the much shorter letter. And let's <clears throat> see what it says here, the first reference to Abraham in Galatians. Things were the same with Abraham. And here in this translation, here there is a quote. He trusted God. And as the final act in the drama by which God set Abraham fully right, God recognized Abraham's faithful trust. 
So Paul is now starting to talk about Abraham because his opponents also talk about Abraham. And Abraham is contested turf. Who owns Abraham in this controversy? Who is most faithful to the meaning of Abraham in relation to uh, the belief in Jesus and so on? <clears throat> well, what about Romans? What are we to say? Have we found Abraham to be our forefather according to the flesh? So here is Abraham again as contested turf in Romans, just as in Galatians. These are conspicuous similarities. And then there is a, <clears throat> a tension or a polarity between from, from this, from the circumcision controversy, between a, an emphasis on identity, preservation of identity, or a vision of inclusion. And here, our text again, <coughs> here is <coughs> Galatians, famous verse, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or fem female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So if your message is a message of preservation of identity, the way you express that is by circumcision. That's what preservation of identity means. If you let go of circumcision, you have a different emphasis where the distinction between Jew or Greek has ceased because circumcision is the main point. And <clears throat> this has now been superseded, as it were, in Paul's idea. So what does it do here in Romans? <clears throat> For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised in behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and a servant to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Vision of inclusion, not preservation of identity as the primary thing. <clears throat> and then... Uh, uh, one more thing now still on the similarities. This one is beautiful and I have written an article about it and in, in, the, in a theological journal. Uh, so there is the term Abba, Father, that occurs in Romans and Galatians. So this term is a, a remarkable term because, uh, uh, because the context, what is the background for it? The context is <clears throat> that this is a, an expression, Abba is this to say father in Aramaic. So here he's using an Aramaic term uh, in these letters. And let's read the text first and then we will uh, see what, we, uh, what it might mean. So here in Galatians, and because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our uh, hearts, crying, Abba, father. So here... Paul is drawing on an experience that the Galatian believers have had. When in the early church a person was baptized, immersed under water, and they came up out of the water, as part of the baptismal lit liturgy, the person would say, Abba, Father, to express that the person has entered into a new relationship with God. That expression in here in this context, the baptismal setting of it, also echoes Jesus' prayer language in Gethsemane. The same phrase, Abba, Father, is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 36. But it also echoes Abraham. Remember here, Abraham, because when Abraham walks with Isaac to the Mount Moriah, there is a conversation where the son says to the father, Abba, and there is an echo in the a sort of Abrahamic echo there as well. Well, how does this do in Romans in chapter 8? For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption in which we cry out, Abba, Father. So these are very big similarities between Galatians 
uh, and Romans, as though something continues, as though the issues are the same, as though Paul's opponents may also be the same. That's what we're leading to. So a couple more points now, <clears throat> not under number one, but here there is a comparison of credentials also, a sort of contest, who are you, who am I, uh, in these letters. Uh, and in Galatians, Paul says in the chapter one, about the message he preaches, I did not receive it from a human being. I was not taught it. I did not ask advice from anyone. I didn't go to Jerusalem. I did go eventually. I barely spoke to Peter. That is to say, Paul is establishing his apostolic credentials independently of some other authority. He is an apostle called by God, and he defends his apostolic credentials. And he does the same in uh, Romans. On some points I have written to you rather boldly, because of the grace given to me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. And these are quite solemn uh, terms. Paul is now not just a prophet or a preacher or a pastor. He is also like the priests in the Jerusalem temple, except that the arena is the Gentile world. So here in these texts, Paul defends his apostolic credentials and he actually belittles the credentials of his opponents. There is a contrast there as well. And then there is a contrast in uh, the missions that you have to uh, listen carefully to, to grasp. <laughs> so here he is in Galatians rebuking the other people whose mission, what is their mission? Their mission is to get the people who believe in Jesus to get circumcised. But whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. And Paul's mission, what is that? Thus I make it my ambition to proclaim the good news, not where Christ has already been named, so that I do not build on someone else's foundation. What does it mean? Paul is a pioneering missionary. He goes into uncharted territory and his opponents they are coming after him. They are not pioneers. They are what has happened in so much of Christian communities or believing communities. People who attack someone else. And I can see even in my own faith community that there are a lot of counter missionaries, as it were, or a lot of counter missionary activity. I won't elaborate. And then finally, that there is explicit mention of counter-missionaries. We are not inventing something, they are real. Not that there is another gospel, he says in Galatians, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So these are real people, real issues. And <clears throat> what in Romans, this very long text, at the end of Romans, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to keep an eye on those who cause dissensions and offenses in opposition to the teaching that you have learned. Avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the simple-minded. For while your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you, I want you to be wise in what is good and guileless in what is evil. So let's <clears throat> add it up. First, this is a representation of the conflict of, in Galatia, as though it is a conflict happening in three acts. In act number one, Paul arrives, he preaches, Galatians are baptized, there's an emphasis on inclusion. There's a relationship of trust, Abba, Father. And then Paul leaves. After he has left, the teachers arrive, the counter-missionaries. They teach. They preach circumcision. There's an emphasis on identity. And maybe a relationship that regresses 
from a relationship of trust to one of fear. And then in Act 3, Paul's letter arrives, Galatians. It, uh, uh, the letter arrives, he re-preaches the message in, in the letter, no to circumcision, emphasis on inclusion. He re basically repeats all the stuff he did in Act 1. What about Romans? So it doesn't fit exactly, but it's a little similar, except that in Act 1, Paul's letter arrives, and Paul preaches preemptively because he feels that there is some threat to the faith community in Rome. And uh, the Romans have been baptized, so they are not baptized as a consequence of the letter. They are believers already. He emphasizes inclusion. He emphasizes trust, Abba, Father. Then, as more than a hypothetical threat, there are teachers. Have they arrived? Will they arrive? That they are there and they will teach, and there will be emphasis on circumcision and identity and so on. And eventually, in an act still to come, Paul will travel to Rome. <clears throat> so here is my adjudication of this. These are the main uh, alternatives for why Romans was written. And the one, in my view, that has by far the highest explanatory power is the counter-missionary view. The Spanish view is not <coughs> uh, Im implausible. It has some evidence for it. I don't think it is strong enough. And the idea that he writes to mediate between the weak and the strong is a, is a legitimate view, but it doesn't explain the other features of the letter. It doesn't explain the similarity between Galatians and Romans. <clears throat> so, just to have this Paul and the counter-missionaries, Paul, vision of inclusion, counter-missionaries, vision of identity, and summarizing. To send a letter in Roman imperial times was costly, risky, and time-consuming. It took a compelling reason to send a letter, a very compelling reason. One of the things to be accounted for in Romans, of the things to be accounted for in Romans, nothing is more conspicuous than the similarity to Galatians. In these letters, we have contestants and a contest of visions between inclusion, Paul, and preservation of identity, the teachers. This is not the only contrast. There are more and some things that are related to it. But this contrast is a big one and we will go on from there.